Welcome to New York City and Mission City Church. We're here to connect people with God and with each other. We hope you're encouraged by this week's message. Good morning, church. Um, Today's scripture is going to be from Genesis chapter 37, verses 2 through 11. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pastoring the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was a son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we are binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. What a great God we have to worship, and also, to a lesser degree, but still a good one, what a church we have to gather with. It's so great to see you today. I don't know what you did yesterday, but we moved um, apartments in the rain. It was as fun as you think it was. And, uh, and, but we're done. But um, today, as we were coming into church, we, uh, we just were passing different sites. You know, we're coming from a different neighborhood now, so our, our way to the same place was just through a slightly different angle. And when that happens, it just kind of refreshes your joy a little bit. You know, I don't know if you've ever had like a long-term uh, friendship, or maybe a spouse, or, so, or some, uh, some person that you've known, maybe a parent, just somebody you've known a long time, but then when you see them in a new light, or in a new way, or in a fresh context, it just does a little something, you know, to make you appreciate who this person is, you know, or, or maybe a home, you know, or, or an old home, you know, if you go back and see a place in a new way, it may just create, I don't know, nostalgia, but in real time, you know, an appreciation for exactly what it is you have. So anyway, as we were coming into church today from the opposite direction than what we normally do, it just reminded me what a sweet and precious uh, chapter this is of life to worship God together and to be together in his presence, friends. So um, I'm, I am thankful to be here. I'm Garrett, by the way, and I'm service pastor if we didn't get to meet already. Um, today is about the work of God. How does God work? How do we discern how God works, etc.? You heard um, during the prayer, and I hope you prayed in agreement, what Nate, uh, our, our worship pastor, prayed just a moment ago before the message was, God, will you do a work that only you can do? So we actually think, and that was naturally, he didn't know necessarily that this you know, specific topic was coming. And it's amazing how we often dwell on the work of God. And we wonder, how does he work? And we often struggle to detect whether he's working. You ever been in that mental conversation where you were like, was that the spirit of God trying to tell me something? Or was that just like my thoughts? You know, like I can't tell where is God moving or where's just kind of my ideas. We often get a similar question when it comes to interpreting events. We're like, okay, is, is this some kind of a sign? You know, we look at the events of our lives and we think, okay, is this God working and kind of lighting a path to this way? Or is that like totally not it and maybe I should go this other way? And so we find ourselves wondering, is God working or is he not? Sometimes our greatest discouragements can come when we, we feel like he's not working. We're like, I don't feel like God's active in this situation. I'm not sure what to make of this situation. I feel kind of stuck, kind of stranded, and I just don't have a lot of evidence that he's working. I can confess, um, this one is tough for me because, and uh, maybe no other topic has been as refined in me through the process of church planting the last four years during a pandemic. Believe me, uh, this church started from scratch uh, 
almost four years ago with just a handful of people, like could count us on one hand number of people. And then it slowly grew and we were kind of on our way. Um, and then the pandemic hit and we were all kind of stuck inside. And believe me, for about 18 months, there was not a ton of evidence that God was working. And we, we, had, we had moved our whole, we had quit jobs and left family to come here and try this and everything. And believe me, we had some chances to ask some really soul searching questions about is God working and how do you know when he is? So for each of us in our own various areas of life, you may have never quit your life, you know, to move to another city and try to start a church from scratch. But I know this, you're trying to do something with your life. You're trying to do, you're working on something. Look at you all. You're such motivated people. It's just bleeding off of you. I can see it. Okay. You're working on something. And when you feel like God's not working on it with you, that's hard, whether that's a relationship or a job or a career or a project, or maybe even a life here in this city. So how is it that we can detect God's work would be kind of the question of the hour. Like, where is it? How can you know with certainty that God is working? And there are a few clues today that we're going to pick up from a very, very old story. It's a story in the book of Genesis, which we've been studying for the last um, four months now. Probably our longest uh, collection of sermons on any one book ever in the, in the whole church. So four, four months straight now, and we're, we're kind of coming to the beginning of the end. The last main character that steps on the scene in the book of Genesis is a man named Joseph. And if you remember the generations of, of, of how God began a family who would lead to a nation that would lead to a savior, we've got Abraham and then his son Isaac and then his son Jacob, also known as Israel, um, same person, and then his sons, which were, uh, which were many, um, and those sons of Jacob led to the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's where we're at in context. Joseph was one of those sons of Jacob slash Israel. And so that's where we're at in the story here. And Joseph is the last main character to come on the scene in the book of Genesis. He appears in chapter 37 and then carries the way through the rest of the book. We were actually in Genesis 38 last week looking at the story of Judah, which was an interesting little aside there in Genesis chapter 38. So we're starting one chapter before then, and then we'll carry the, the story of Joseph through the rest of the time. I'll be honest with you. I don't know if we're spending two weeks with Joseph or four. I have no idea. I do know that the story of Joseph shows a lot about God, it shows a lot about humanity, it shows a lot about this world, and it shows a lot about our own lives, believe it or not, even though this is ancient literature, it's inspired by God, so that when we look at it, we see him, but we also see how he interacted, not only back then, but here and now. So we're gonna study the life of Joseph here as we finish our Genesis series. I don't know how many weeks, but we're gonna make it a little bit of the way today on the story of Joseph. Looking for how does he work, and let me tell you, the way God worked in Joseph's life has parallels with the way he still does because the way God interacts is a pattern, a pattern, a model, and a promise for the way that he interacts with us still today. And I think we'll see some of those moments, three of them specifically, as we move through the story. So here we go. It says, these are the generations of Jacob. That means the lineage of Jacob. Here's the story. Here's kind of how it all went down. Joseph, which is a child of Jacob, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers, and he was young. A younger. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. Wives. So I just want to be clear. Not everything the Bible mentions, the Bible condones. Okay? So this multiple wives thing is not condoned by the Bible. It's accurately recorded as what people did. Okay? But not condoned. God's model was in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, one man and one wife. Right? That was the idea in God's mind. This was the idea of men, okay? Uh, just accurately preserved here as part of the scriptures. But his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them, of his brothers, back to their father. You can call this the tattletale. You can call this whatever you want to call it. But he brings back a bad report. They've done something wrong. They're not doing it right, blah, blah, blah. Might have even been true, but it was still a tattle. But that's what he did. Now, Israel, that's Jacob, same person, loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age. Now, this might be another little hint at something that's not necessarily how it's supposed to go, but it's just how it sometimes does go. Um, that's where, you know, a parent who is, um, you know, just getting older and then has a child kind of uh, maybe by accident later in life, you know, or maybe on purpose later in life. But in any case, it just seems like you ever looked at that much, much younger brother or sister and it's like they are not getting the discipline <laughs> that I got. OK, something is changed here. OK, and it's not necessarily supposed to be that way. That's just how it sometimes is. And but it, it's not just that Israel or, or Jacob was taking it easy on Joseph. He actually loved it more, it says. He, he kind of had a favorite son. Not sure you're supposed to have a favorite son, but he certainly did. 
And Jacob made Joseph a robe of many colors. Now, this is a Hebrew text, and this is one of those places where it's kind of hard to know exactly what the, the translation means. Yours probably says, of many colors. Your translation might also say it was ornate. Um, and here's the thing. Um, multicolored clothes would have been hard to, to get by, right? So dyeing colors, this and that. You know, the, we, the textile industry was obviously not then what it is now, okay? So a coat of many colors was a special thing, all right? Whether it was colors or whether it was the finishings, something about this coat was... Um, let's put it this way. Jacob didn't have money to buy 13 of them, okay? He bought one, and it went to Joseph, all right? So that's the way it went. So when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they were totally cool with it because they were mature and partial. No. They hated him, and they could not speak peacefully to him. It just, you just couldn't come out. You ever tried to speak peacefully to somebody and then like something else just comes out? You just, you make up your mind. You're like, I'm going to be so nice. And then you see somebody and it just goes another direction. They could not speak peacefully to him. Now, Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He doesn't even know how to help himself. So Joseph said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. This is not unclear. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you going to rule over us? I mean, can you imagine, okay, your little brother, okay, comes to you. Okay, so you're growing up, okay. And how old was he? He was 17 years old. Okay, so let's say you're in college and you have a little brother who's 17 years old and he's a junior in high school and he comes to you and he says, I had a dream that you will bow down to me. You would say, that's a funny dream, you know, because that's never, ever, ever going to happen. So he says this, and they hate him even more for his dreams and for his words. And then, unfortunately, I don't know if Joseph just had, like, compulsive truth-telling where he didn't know how to not shut up, but he says, then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father even, the, the, the favoritistic father, rebuked him, and he said, you know, a little too far here, said to him, what, what is this dream you have dreamed? Shall I and your, the sun, the moon, the stars, shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? That's backwards. That's upside down. That's the opposite of the way it's supposed to go. Water runs downhill, not uphill. Honor goes from the younger to the older, not the reverse. So this is backwards. And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father actually kept the saying in mind. So somehow the dad, Jacob, says out loud what any of us would say, kind of the world's math, which is, it doesn't work that way, knock it off. But then privately in the back of his mind, he kind of stuck it in the back of his mind and went, you know, maybe in this case it does. And we'll see how, what, this, what this comes to be. Because I wonder if Jacob happen to know something about the way God tends to work. When God is involved, things aren't always right side up. Sometimes God's work is often, actually, upside down. So this is a first hint that we still, it's still intact today. It, it, was, it was then and it's now that God's work is often upside down. It is the opposite of what you expect. It is not according to human concepts what you think is going to happen or even should happen. All right. So in this case, um, this is actually a prophecy that, that, that um, the entire family at some point in the future would find themselves bowing down before this young one, before Joseph. And it would be validated. We'll see that in one of the coming weeks here as we unpack the, the story of Joseph. But God's work is beginning in the life of Joseph here, and it is often upside down. That means things happen that you simply do not expect. Let's take a few examples. First off, how about the, 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 the identity of Jesus entering into this world as a carpenter from the middle of nowhere? Now, if you're expecting, if you read the Old Testament cover to cover, and you know that in this Old Testament that there is promised a Messiah figure that's going to come, a special person, right, who's going to liberate people forever and all eternity, you would probably be expecting a glorious military leader who rides in in much power and triumph. And guess what? That's exactly what everybody was expecting. But God wanted to do an upside down thing. So when he came into the world, he was born in a manger, in a stable. We forget the, 
the scandal of Christmas, how upside down Christmas is, because it seems right side up to us. We're like, okay, there's the nativity scene in my grandmother's yard, just like it's always been, and we've come to expect the stable and the straw and the animals and such, okay? That's all part of it. That seems right side up to us. That's because we don't know, we, we forget how upside down that is. If he's going to be Messiah, he should have been born on a pillow, okay? Not in something rough, you see. And he should have been born in, I mean, where else but Jerusalem? Probably on the top of Mount Moriah, where the temple was. I mean, in the Holy of Holies is where the Messiah probably should be born. But he wasn't. He was born in Bethlehem, you see. And then raised in Nazareth. Both insignificant little places. Now, of course, known to history. So Bethlehem and Nazareth all seem right side up to us. But we forget how upside down that is. That he would be born in a small place. And raised in another small place. In, an, in, in a region known as Galilee, which was... Kind of, I mean, questionable. You know, it was kind of questionable. If you're running around Jerusalem and you're from Galilee, you were just maybe a little less than, okay? So the region that he was from was even cause for suspicion. God is willing to work in ways that are upside down. And this philosophy, and let's go to the cross for a second. The cross of Jesus Christ. Did you know the cross was a common but awful torture instrument that the empire, the state of Rome, would use against people in mass. They would cut down forests to create forests of crosses to create terror. And Jesus, the Messiah of the world, ends up on one of them. I assure you that didn't feel like what was expected. Now, that feels right side up to us. We're used to it. We've polished the cross up. You know, we get it on our, on our neck. You know what I mean? We hang it on our wall in, in various decorative ways. Nothing wrong with that, except maybe it tempts us to forget how upside down, how wrong, how off script that would have seemed that the Messiah of the world would die. Now, on a criminal's cross, you know, I guarantee you, we read the Bible, we read the New Testament, the story of the cross, and we're like, ah, here comes the part where, you know, here's the whole cross bit. Okay, this is not what the first disciples did. The first disciples were like, whoa, we're off track here. There's no way that the road could go this far down before it goes up. You know, there's no way that this could be part of the story. But God's work is always upside down. Often, 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 I should say, upside down. And the church in the earliest days was built on this. Listen to this from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is early Christian literature and the inspired words of, the inspired words of God for you and I. This is a challenge from an early Christian leader, an apostle named Paul. And he is saying out loud that God's work is often upside down and challenging people who think otherwise. And he's proving that the church is not built and the, and the whole following of Jesus thing is not built on human normal pride and resources and strength and talent or whatever. And this is what, what he writes. Where is the one who is wise? Meaning in human terms. Bring me your smart people. Where's the scribe? So your learned people. Where's the debater of this age? You know, the feisty person who thinks they're always right. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Meaning you can take your smartest people, your most studied people, your debaters, your talk show people who always got a hot sports opinion. You can line all them up and God has made them all seem foolish despite their worldly wisdom. Because he works upside down. For since in the wisdom of God, in the, in the wise ways of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. You can't know God by climbing a human ladder of talent or achievement or pride or knowledge or whatever. It's upside down. God comes to us. So we can't know God through our own human resources. It pleased God through the folly, the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. So in this, in this world and in this context in the first century, um, the Jews were the, the people of God, the people of Israel, and Gentiles was a, or Greeks was a catch-all word, meaning every other nation, every other tribe, every other people group. And there were different traits between those two. The Jews demanded a sign. Prove to me that you're the Messiah of the Old Testament. Do a miracle for me. The Greeks wanted wisdom. Remember, they were just a few hundred years removed from Plato and all these others. Okay, So they want to feel smart about it. And what Paul says here is that Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but God's not doing either one of those. We preach Christ crucified. We have a Messiah on a cross. Those two things don't mix. A Messiah on a cross. That's what we have. That seems upside down to everyone. But that is what we preach. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks from all over the world, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. And then this sentence. For the foolishness of God. 
Now, God's not foolish, right? What is he using? He's using hyperbole. The, if, God was, if, if a part of God was foolish, the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Meaning, if there was any part of God that was foolish or weak, it would still be smarter than our best, okay? God, and that's why he was willing to put a Messiah on a cross to save everyone by faith. This is how God works. He's working in, he works in upside down ways and this still affects people. Listen, what could this mean for you? You can be from anywhere and you can follow God and you can be faithful and put one foot in front of the other and belong in all the most important ways that a person's supposed to belong and you can be comfortable in your own skin and you can live the life to which you've been called because you've been called by God. You don't have to be ashamed of who you are, where you're from, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't matter if you're this world's draft pick or not. It doesn't matter if you're the debater of this age. It doesn't matter if you're the smart of this age, okay? God cooks with the ingredients that are available to him. It doesn't matter if those ingredients are polished, okay? His work is often upside down and he can make you into something great. Listen, for his glory and his credit, I spent several years as a young adults pastor. So um, while I was a young adult, so a lot of peer-to-peer leadership. And during that time, it was amazing to watch how people would come into the church and some of them would be mighty in the ways of the world, attractive in the ways of the world. Their career was on track. Their network was on track. Their net worth was on track. Everything's just on track. All right. They're feeling great about themselves and about life. But there, was this, there could be sometimes an unmistakable air of like pride and self-satisfaction. And this sense, a lack of a need for God, because they know they're the wise of this age. They know they got it made, right? A lot of confidence coming off some of these people. But then there would be another person, another person who didn't have any of those things going for themselves and would have this attitude of like, I don't know what God could ever do through me, but I'm here to serve and I'm available. And And listen, people would be drawn like magnets to the second person because of their lowliness of spirit, having it in common with Christ. And I would be watching it as a young adults leader, thinking, I cannot wait to see, because the first person, I feel like God is likely to bring down a notch, okay, which look out below when that happens. And then the, person, the second person, God is likely to bring up a notch and to exalt, because he chose what's wise, he chose what's foolish in this world to shame the wise, you see. So he often works in upside down ways. And this means a lot to me, too, because I'm from the middle of nowhere, okay? And sometimes that'll come up in conversation, you know? (laughs) Like, I live in New York now. I'm trying to raise my kids here now and all this. And people will be like, where are you from? And I'm like, oh, I'm from Texas. And they look at me, you know, sometimes concerned. And and I'll say, and they'll, you know, and they'll look at me, okay, Dallas, Fort Worth. And I'm like, no, like somewhere you've never heard. And my granddad had a horse ranch for good measure. And his dad and his brother. Anything else you want to know? But here's the thing. I'm serving the one who comes from Nazareth. I'm fine to be from the middle of nowhere and be out here. I'm comfortable in my own skin. Are you? Listen, it doesn't matter where you're from or or what things you have going for you or not going for you. If you are willing to entrust yourself to God, you'll find yourself comfortable all of a sudden because God chooses what is foolish in the world, weak in the world to shame the wise and the strong. God's work's often upside down. Let's return to the story of Joseph. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. So something enters the scene here is human deceit. They conspired. Human deceit has entered the story. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. <laughs> Come now, let us kill him. Not let's get him back. Let's kill him. Okay, so these, these guys are not, they are offended. And throw him into one of the pits. I don't know if these pits are from working or if these are like half-dug wells that people gave up. I don't know. But let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say, that's deceit, we will say something not true. We'll say that a fierce animal has devoured him and we will see what becomes of his dreams. They're really salty about these dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands. So Reuben's one of the sons and he's like, oh no, this is too far. And he says, let's not take his life. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. And he chooses his words very carefully. For all he knows, they're going to say, well, you can go with him then, Reuben. So he chooses his words really carefully. And he said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, don't lay a hand on him. So maybe we just let him starve or die or something, let's not kill him, but leave him in there. And then his plan was that he might go back and rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So Reuben secretly wants to rescue him. 
So when Joseph came to his brothers, they go through with this. They stripped him of his robe, the coat of many colors, right, that he wore, and he took him, they threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. They sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites. These are actually distant cousins, by the way, coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm, and myrrh, going to trade somewhere. Of course, Egypt, which is the center of the trade universe at this time, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah prior to the events of his life that we studied last week, just one chapter ahead. Then Judah said to his brothers, what profit is it? He's kind of running with Reuben on this. What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Why so much deceit? Come, let us just sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he's our brother. He's our own flesh and blood. And his brothers listened. Then the Midianite traders passed by. They drew Joseph up, lifted him out of the pit. They sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt, and God was still working. There is no evidence that God is working. Do you notice the narrator didn't even, like, pull aside? There was not even a parenthesis that's like, but God was working. Like, it's just, there's no evidence. Joseph couldn't see it. They couldn't see it. Nobody had any idea that God was working. All anybody could see is that human deceit is driving. But God was still working, which tells us something that's still true today. God's work is often concealed by human deceit for a time until it's revealed later. For a time, God's work looks like human work of evil. For a time, God's work of good can be dressed up as a human work of evil. It's as if when human hands are doing the most evil, God can be holding the wrists, making them do good in ways they could never have seen. Again, we go to the cross. We mentioned recently that maybe the worst human sins ever committed would be to actually nail Jesus to a cross, right? But it says even that was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God who had predestined everything to take place. They were doing the will of God, even though it seemed like the cross of Christ was only a work of human deceit. When we look back at the cross of Christ, we see God's work. Like there's the Savior of the world dying for the sins of humanity. And that's true, by the way. At the time, it would have felt like human deceit was running everything. Here is Pontius Pilate trying to massage the crowd and choose the path of least resistance because he doesn't have a backbone. And then here's Herod over here wanting to work his angle and get some kind of a miracle out of Jesus. And then there's the crowd who's just a mindless mob being willing to follow whoever has got the loudest, most persuasive voice. And then um, there's, the, there's the Pharisees working their angle and trying to put Jesus to death and pulling the strings behind the scene. It is the, the cross of Christ is a web. Of, if you study just the human behavior, it's a web of human deceit. But concealed in that was the salvation of the world for everyone. Because God's work is often concealed by human deceit for a time until it's revealed later, you see. So this is good news for you and for me. If you've ever been lied to, if human deceit has ever affected you, if you've been pressed down by people or persons or, or a system, if you've ever been hurt and felt like, you know what, the boss was deceitful or the person was deceitful or the parent was deceitful or some, the child was deceitful, like if you've ever felt the sting of human deceit on your life, that doesn't mean that God is not going to reveal to have been at work all along. It is possible. God's work is often concealed by human deceit. He often waits to show his his hand among these things until afterward. It's not like Joseph went into the pit and was like, God is at work. Okay, it felt like human deceit was at work. Okay, which brings us to our final point. It says, then they took Joseph's robe and they slaughtered a goat. How far is deceit going to go? They're going to, they're going to kill an animal And then they're going to, so this is two deaths now, one human, one animal, um, both senseless. And they're going to dip the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colors, covered in blood now, and brought it to their father and said, we found this. Please identify whether it's your son's robe or not. And, of course, Jacob identified it and said, it is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. This is all human deceit. This is all a lie. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments, put sackcloth on his, on his loins, and mourned for his day's son many days. So this is an ancient form of showing grief for many days. Let's emphasize many days. What does it feel like to lose someone for many days? What does it feel like? to have lost someone to a tragic death unexpectedly for many days. What does it feel like, especially if it's a child, okay, for many days, 
This takes a long time. All of his sons and daughters rose up to try to comfort him. All right, Dad, enough, enough mourning. It's okay. we got to live life here. But he refused to be comforted. And he said, no, I shall go down to Sheol, meaning until the day I die, I will go to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. And it was a long, long time. And he wouldn't know that the, the, the human deceit wouldn't be unraveled and uncovered for years, a long time, which tells us one final thing about God's work today. God's work is often painfully slow. God's work is often painfully slow, way slower than we want it to go. God's work is often painfully slow. It would be a very long time before the big ta-da was going to happen. It wasn't days of discomfort. It wasn't months of discomfort. It was years of discomfort. And this tells us something. Listen, you might not be able to detect that, you know, that God may not come out from behind the curtain and say, look, it was me. I got it. I had it all along. That moment might not come for a very long time. And in earthly terms, it might not come at all. It might only come when you're in the presence of God in eternity. Some of the human deceitful things that have been done on this planet won't be fully exposed and, and fixed and, and repaired until the eternal state, right? But, but, you'll find, just because it's painfully slow doesn't mean it's not happening. You know, one of the things that it just immediately affects us is when we feel like, well, if he's so slow, maybe he's not doing anything. Maybe he's not doing anything. Listen, I can't even tell you, I can feel my mood change. This will have an effect on you up to the moment. If you are in a hard situation for any reason, and you are convinced God is doing nothing with it, hands off the wheel, distant, it's on you, God's not working. You are going to feel, going to, you might get used to it and maybe try to call it something else, but you're going to feel discouragement, depression, anxiety. Why? Discouragement because God is not at work. Um, depression and abandonment because God has left you alone. Anxiety because you're overestimating your own part. And you're like, oh, I got to do it then. If God ain't going to do it, I got to do it. So it is going to affect you if you believe, you know what, because God is slow, maybe God's not here at all. That is going to, and I feel that, oh my gosh, I can feel when I've like taken a step toward independence from God. You know why? Because I immediately get exhausted. Immediately. I take like a half step. Life is too complicated now. I think I used to be able to get away with it maybe a little longer before. Now life is so exhausting and so challenging. I take like a half step toward independence from God and I'm like, oh my gosh, what's the matter? And I can feel my emotional state literally change. And for some reason I put down my belief that God's at work and I just think, you know what, Garrett's gotta work. And when that happens, oh, I, the, the immediate result is exhaustion. But the opposite is true. If you've been laboring under that for a long time, if you can realize, oh wait, just because God is working slowly and I haven't begun to detect that yet, doesn't mean he's not working. God is at work in the moment when I feel most thrown into a pit of human design is the moment that God can be at work. And when that happens, your emotional load can lift. It will have an effect on your mood immediately. There's an, a powerful idea out there. If you could believe in your most challenging moments, God could be at work still. If you could believe that for a second when you're in an exhausting work relationship or just an exhausting relationship relationship and you could believe God is still at work. I've been married to this person for 12 years and yeah, God can still be at work, okay? God can still be at work. I've been at this work job for so long and it's just like that. God can still be at work. It's just painfully slow. You know what we want? Uh, we, I, I told you I just moved. I am so tired of putting furniture together out of boxes. Oh my gosh, I am tired. And whenever we put furniture out of boxes, this is what we want, because this is what they sell you, and this is what we have in mind. That's my new nightstand. Um, we like finished product, but this is where it starts. Um, yeah, so this is what I've been doing for a lot of time. If I haven't returned your text yet, I promise I want to. I've been doing this, okay, way too much, okay? This is, okay, if we could go back to the first slide, this is what you want your life story to be, and then one more time, this is what it is, okay? Oh, wait, let's go back one more time. This is your, this is what you want your moral life to be, and let's, let's go back one more time. This is what your moral life is, all right? Let's go back one more time. This is what you want Mission City Church to be. Fully done. It's ready. It's ready to accommodate you and all of your needs. Okay, and this is what Mission City Church is, okay? Let's go back one more time. This is the marriage you want. That one. 
Let's go back one more time. This is the marriage you have forever, okay? Because on this side of eternity, it's just not going to be done. It's going to be painfully slow. My wrist hurts from turning a screwdriver. And I got a big box of a dresser that I ain't even put together yet waiting on me today. And it's going to look like that for a long time, right? And then as soon as I get it all done, I'm going to be like, ah, oh, it's neat. One of them's going to break or my daughter's going to color on it with a marker, okay? You're never done. We want finished and we want done. Here's what I want to ask you. When you show up to this in some area of your life, okay, you can do one of two things. You can sense, hmm, there is a work in progress, and that's okay. Or you can just complain about it, okay, and just be lazy about it and gripe about it and just be some, like, sophomoric snob who just is just discouraging about everything and is just like, ah, oh, I've seen this before, blah, 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 and you just start to gripe about it, okay? Listen, can you believe that even though it's painfully slow, Something is going to come of this, okay? Something's going to come of your life. Something's going to come of the time. This is how some people, like, they're like, this is why I can't read the Bible. It just feels so scattered. Or, you know, like, my, here, here's your attendance record on how your Bible reading is going, okay? And we just, we're like, it doesn't make sense. I can't make, I can't get it going. Listen, it's never going to be done, done until you are in heaven. That's when it's done, done. Learn at home, at church, learn to tolerate this, okay? I'm not saying you just live in it forever and then just, some people, unfortunately, just tiptoe through it forever, okay? You need to do something, all right? And you participate and labor a little bit to build. But listen, it, it, don't have an intolerance for the process. That's what I'm trying to tell you. God's work is painfully slow. I heard somebody the other day, um, let's go back to the church and the building of a new congregation for a second. Um, I think a lot about this church. I think a lot about this church. I think a lot. If you think you think a lot about this church, and I know you do. I see you. Yeah, I know. You all think about this church a lot. I know because I interact with you all the time. I think about this church a lot, okay? And I just want to tell you, I, it's been slower than I thought it was going to go, and that's okay. Learning to tolerate that has been the best lesson for me. I'm telling you, I was listening to a, I was listening to a, a, a church planter from another city teach maybe, a, I don't know, six months ago. And he brought up, you know, how slow it is to plant a new congregation. And he was like, guys, I'll be honest with you. It took me two years for us to gather 100 people. And I was like, four years, 50 people. You know, I'm like doing the math. And I'm like, it's slow. It's okay if it's slow. Let it be slow. Do you know what happens if you can't let it be slow? You pressurize yourself and others. And you disciple yourself and you disciple others into your anxiety. And it is not healthy for anybody right? And here's the thing. If at the heart of a church isn't the idea that like, God's work is painfully slow, you know what's going to happen? If that idea is not at the middle, that God's work can be painfully slow, you know what it is going to be at the middle? A human's idea that it should go fast. And that's going to stress everybody out, okay? So listen, you've got to have, and move that to your relationship, to your job, to your life, to your career. It is going to be painfully slow, and that's okay. I've sat with friends who were like, I want to quit. I just want to quit my job. Do I have another job? No, I do not. I just want to quit my job. And we're like, just hang in there and something else will materialize. God's work is painfully slow. All right, just hang in there. I want to quit. I want to quit. Just hang in there because God's work is painfully slow. If you can tolerate that, your ability to tolerate that is very close to the definition of maturity. Very close to the definition of maturity. And listen, I want to close by telling you, in the end, God's work was done on the cross of Christ so that we don't have to work in the most important way. The most important work any of us can do is to relate to God. I know our to-do list has other immediate things on it, but ultimately the most important thing any of us can do is relate to God. That's the work of a lifetime. But it turns out it's the rest of a lifetime because the scripture says we should strive, that's a work word, to enter his rest, which means that what Christ has achieved for us on the cross through his cross and resurrection is the ability to rest from working to relate to God because God has done all of the work to relate to us through the cross and resurrection. So it is a great sense of relaxation in the presence of God. Listen, I believe, in, I believe in the spiritual disciplines. I believe in action. But I can tell you this. Action is only anxiety if it's not downwind from the rest, from the rest of God. The, fir the first and securing move for our souls is to say, all of God's work is done. All of the work of, all of, the work of bringing me to God through the cross is done. So I'm going to now strive not to enter the striving. I'm going to strive to enter the rest. And from that rest comes a peaceful posture. From that rest comes a tolerance for God's work on, the, on his terms. And listen, 
he's just too he's just too creative to do it in the same way twice. He's too creative to work in a way that you can predict. He is too creative to do it on your terms, okay? He's too creative for you to write the script and then hand it to him so he can read his lines, okay? He's too creative for all that. He's not going to be confined by your ideas, but he is at work. He's not going to be, praise God he's not confined. I think about some of my ideas I wish God in the past had been confined by, and I praise God that he told me no, right? About where to go or what to do or what decision to make, right? So let us have a tolerance for the upside down, okay? And see, hey, this could be a place where God's at work even though nobody expects it. Let us have a tolerance for the idea that, you know what, even though it looks like human deceit is driving over there, God could be about to step out of the shadows at some point in the future and prove that he was the one at work all along. And let's have a tolerance for understanding this might take a long time. But if we can have a tolerance for those things, all of a sudden we'll have a discerning eye to recognize the work of God in our life and in the lives of those around us. Let's pray. Holy Father, thank you for your work in our lives. Lord, nobody, you didn't, nobody could make you work in our lives. Um, it's just a privilege that you would even want to. Nobody could force you, talk you into it. You weren't obligated by the laws of being God um, to, to work in our lives. You didn't have to. You just decided to out of your own volition. Thank you for choosing to set this grace on us that you interact with us and you interact with these situations. Um, Lord, you and, and all of us, you interact with the one who throws people into pits and you interact with the one who was thrown into the pit and you are at work bringing us to yourself through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us enter your rest in an ultimate sense. The rest we need is rest for our souls from striving to save ourselves by achieving significance or writing our own story full of rich experiences or something or expanding our horizon of possibilities and options or climbing the tax brackets or whatever other worthless pursuit we've pressurized to try to turn ourselves into something. Help us strive to stay away from that striving and help us strive to enter your rest. Help us feel that sense of peace when we know the most important thing is relating to you, and you have done 100% of the job. Let us feel a sense of your embrace and a sense of your guidance and a sense of your work, even when it is not yet felt. God, we can trust that you, what you've done a thousand times is a set pattern and promise. If you've worked in upside-down situations that are cons- just mired in, in human wrongdoing, and you've taken your time, then we can expect that that's still true today. So lift our hearts and lift, let us lift our voices to appreciate we have a God who works in this way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being with us. If these messages are strengthening you in your faith, we want to hear from you. Find us online at missioncity.nyc or email us at info at so we can celebrate everything God's doing in your life. We'll see you next week.